Welcome to episode three of the Scout the Wiz podcast. We've got a very special episode today, consisting of our first special guest, the one and only Steve Buckhands, man who really doesn't need an introduction to Wizards fans, a legend, spent, was it 22 years, Buck? 22? Yep. 22, 22 years. 20 with Phil Chenier and two with Carol Lawson. Amazing. As the play that play voice of the team, he now hosts a podcast with Phil Chenier called On the Road with Buck and Phil. Had some incredible guests. I know you've had Mark Cuban, Bradley Beal, Gilbert Arenas, uh, David Falk. Uh, now announces a bunch of Terps games and all locally. But, Buck, thank you very much for joining me. How are you doing today? Well, it's good to see you, first of all, Brian, and, t- and hear your voice. But uh, I'm doing pretty well. Like you said, you know, just uh, obviously not doing the Wizards. So uh, Fox was nice enough to uh, ask me to do some basketball games. So I've done some Georgetown and Maryland. And uh, James Madison has me doing some games. Uh, their spring football season actually starts Saturday, uh, this Saturday, and um, I'll do some of their games as well. So, you know, keeping busy with that and the podcast, like you said, has been fun. You know, Phil Chenier and I, when we got together and decided to do it, it was like, okay, A, we want to have fun. B, it gives us, a, you know, a voice if anybody cares to listen on, you know, what we have to say about the Wizards and the, the, the tri- uh, trials and tribulations we've been through on the road with uh, the team for 20 years and some of the stuff that happens on the road, which I thought people would find interesting and uh, gives me something to do once a week. So that's pretty much what I've been doing and uh, certainly not going to make me rich, but that's okay. I, uh, we have fun doing it. So uh, we we enjoy it. And like you said, our guests, you know, that's the other thing we said, listen, between Phil and me, our Rolodex is pretty solid. We should be able to get some nice guests. So the guys you mentioned, um, Scott Van Pelt, Ernie Johnson, Gus Johnson, Earl Monroe, Christine Brennan, Michael Wilbon. I mean, Turgeon and Gary Williams, you go on and on and on with these people we've had as guests. And uh, they're all, I think, have had a lot to say and pretty impactful. So it's been fun to talk to these folks. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I, I know, uh, you know, let's go way back. First of all, you grew up in Virginia. You grew up a Bullets fan. I know you were, you know, you were a sports anchor early on. You were a sports director right at a station. How did you actually get the Bullets play-by-play job in the first place? What was that story? Well, you know, if you if you go all the way back to being a Bullets fan, that's where I, my interest obviously started. And that was when I was young, when I was 10 years old. So we're talking 1965. They didn't come here till 67. And that's when my folks started taking me to the Baltimore Civic Center to see them play. So I was privileged to be able to see Earl Monroe when he was here and see guys like Will Chamberlain and Oscar Robertson and these guys that came to Baltimore. And and I just developed a real love for the team. And then after high school, I got into broadcasting at James Madison and um, would cover, come up here and cover the team, covered them when they won the championship in 77 and 78. That's when I was, that's the year I graduated from Madison, but I was working for a TV station then and doing some play-by-play in, in college. I did obviously four years of, of that on the radio at Madison. And then my TV career took me from Harrisonburg where I worked at the local ABC affiliate doing sports to Chattanooga, Tennessee, worked for the NBC station to Nashville, Tennessee, worked for the CBS station to Atlanta, worked for a great TV station in Atlanta, WSB TV, where I worked with Ernie Johnson. He was a news reporter and that was a, um, ABC affiliate, and then got the job at Channel 5 here in 1984. And I was still doing play-by-play, a lot of Big East games, Uh, did um, some games for the NFL on Fox when when Fox first got football, which was 1994, and also did uh, play-by-play for the Naval Academy doing their football games on the radio from 91 to 97. So I had sort of carved out a little bit of a niche doing games play by play and uh, had filled in on a number of occasions for Mel Proctor, who was the bullets, great play by play announcer before me. And he was fabulous. And they had me filling in for him several times to the point where when he left in 1997 to go do San Diego Padres baseball, they had me and Dave Johnson fill out. There was like 20 games left in the bullet schedule that year, 1996 they had us fill out the rest of that schedule. And I did um, the playoff game in Chicago against Michael Jordan and, uh, you know, Pippen and those guys when, when the Bullets had uh, Jawan Weber, Jawan Howard and Chris Weber and, and those guys. 
And I did that game with Phil in Chicago. And so the next year I knew they were going to need a play-by-play guy. And I had a pretty good relationship with Susan O'Malley, who was the team president. And um, I went to her and I said, look, Susan, I know the job's open next year. I would like to, I would like to do the games. And she said, well, that's great, except I can't have you coming to me and saying, you can't do the games in November because we're in the middle of a huge rating period, or you can't do the games in you know, May if we're playing in, in, the, in the playoffs because May is a huge rating period. I said, listen, I'm prepared to leave Channel 5 if I have to, to do these games. You would be, my 100% comp, uh, concentration would be doing bullets basketball. And, you know, she needed to know that. And I was, you know, was truthful. Luckily, I didn't, I wasn't working under a contract at Channel 5 at the time. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to talk to them. But I didn't have my, my contract at that time was up. So I went to Channel 5 and I said, look, and Susan said, okay, that's good. I said, I'm, I'm going to do the bullets next year. If you want me to stay, I can, you know, do both. But at the time, they didn't want to do that. They wanted, uh, you know, a sports guy that was going to be there every every night. So I left Channel 5 in 97, and that's how I got the Bullets job and worked for 22 more years after that, from 97 to eight to, to uh, when I finished here, 19, 2000 and what, 18, whatever. Right. Well, when you started, did you ever think it, it could be something that, you know, would be almost a lifetime job, something you do for 22 years? Or did you think maybe just year by year, see how it goes? Well, you know, back in those days, you would sign a contract with, um, at the time, it was home team sports. And, the, and generally, those contracts were three years. The first year was guaranteed. The second year, the company had an option, but you didn't. And then the third year was, you know, what would, would happen if they, if they said go. So I signed a series. I just kept signing those three-year contracts. One time, I did sign a five-year deal, which was great. So to answer your question, I never looked at it and said, this could be the rest of my career or this could be for the next two decades. I was just excited to be able to do it and to keep signing those contracts. And I never, I never kind of felt like I was going to be replaced. Um, I thought I had a good thing going with Phil Chenier and that everybody liked everything. And, and at the time, everybody did. My general managers at, um, at Home Team Sports, Jody Shapiro, and then uh, Sam Schroeder, and then Rebecca Schulte, and then, you know, eventually the guy that, you know, replaced me. Um, you know, those other fel- folks, I felt like, you know, liked what I did, and we just kept signing contracts, and it went on and on and on. Uh, but it, it shows you how nothing lasts forever. And in this business, especially in our business, uh, one person can come in, and if they don't like what you do, they can, they can change it like that. Uh, it turns out it wasn't really the guy in our business. It was the owners who, who didn't want me back, but um, that's, that's the way it worked out. So it was a long run. It was a great run. Uh, would I still love to be doing the games? Absolutely. That wasn't my decision, but uh, I didn't think it would be 22 years when I signed that deal, but it went by quicker than I thought, Brian. It was a pretty incredible run, but yeah, I mean, you know, like you said, obviously, I don't think any Wizards fans were expecting it to end. I know you obviously weren't, and I know that's that's the more somber note, but, you know, you kind of alluded to it, that it was an ownership management decision. Was was anything ever said to you exactly as to why? Was there any logic given? Not from the ownership side of it. Um, obviously, um, from the management side at, at, at NBC Sports Washington, uh, my, my general, my, the general manager at the time, a guy named Damon Phillips, you know, um, didn't, didn't really say, you know, there was a reason for it. They were up against a, the end of my contract. They had to let me know by a certain date whether they were going to renew my third year. I had one more year left on the contract, which was really disappointing to me. I felt like, you know, they should have at least given me that final year after 22 years of loyalty. And then, if they wanted to talk about doing something after that, we could talk about it, but that didn't happen. So they came to me with the, the very last day of, of when they had to either renew the contract or not, which would have renewed automatically. And they said, we're not going to renew your contract. We're going to explore some other options. Didn't really say why, um, which was unfortunate. That was the probably the most disappointing thing to me. Um, and, um, and that was that. So, it was clear to me that uh, either the owner or his son didn't like what I did, what I did. And, um, 
that's their prerogative. You know, they, they, you know, they, listen, this happened before this happened to Mel Proctor and it happened to the, the very best announcer in all of baseball, John Miller. Mm-hmm. And it happened when Peter Angelos replaced them. Listen, it happened to Marv Albert. Okay. If it happened to Marv Albert in New York, who's a legend, it can happen to anybody. And, you know, uh, for whatever reason, they didn't like what I did and, uh, or what, you know, how I did the games and they wanted, you know, whether it was one, they wanted to go with somebody younger, somebody hipper, they just wanted a new change, a whole new face. You know, they got Phil out of there two years before me, which was to me stunning because a, here's a guy who's legendary here. He's iconic. He's a great broadcaster. People know him. They love him. He's easy to listen to. And truthfully, Brian, I thought, listen, as long as Phil's here, I'm in good shape. Well, he was, they, you know, he went first and then they had me do games with Carol Lawson for two years. And then that was it for me. So nobody ever said anything, but, you know, as I've said publicly before, what was the most disappointing thing to me, and they can have all the reasons they want to replace me, which is fine. Uh, the most disappointing thing to me was that after 22 years of, you know, really being an ambassador for the team and selling the team and the team that I loved, not to mention the 14 years before that of being on Channel 5 and coming into people's living rooms every night covering Super Bowls, the 35 or six years I was in this market, nobody ever said thank you to me, not even thank you, which to me is unconscionable. I, I don't know how you get away with that. But clearly they didn't want to do anything publicly to stoke the fire, so to speak. And um, it didn't, it didn't, uh, it wasn't good for them publicly, but, you know, like I say, they, they got to live with that. Yeah, no, unconscionable, like you said. And I, you know, obviously I, I speak only for, you know, some Wizards fans and Wizards junkies, but I know from the fans at least that there are a lot of thank yous out there and I know you've been touched by some of them and and fans reaching out to you to say how much they enjoyed it and I know I'm sure that meant something but can't even imagine you know why ownership would would say nothing but uh I don't know the, the, the fans like you said meant a lot I mean and I still get it to this day on Twitter I get it every day yeah and um and I've said thank you before publicly to the fans um who have had my back and enjoyed what Phil and I did. Listen, the new guys are, first of all, I did games with Drew Gooden. He's great. He's a good friend. I think he's terrific. And I thought we had good chemistry. I thought he and I would have been a really good pair, Uh, but they didn't see it that way. They had already made up their minds. And Justin is good. He's, he does a great broadcast. I think he's fine and all that. There's nothing wrong with that broadcast and people will, will get used to it. The fact the team doesn't win and they're not good hasn't helped any, but they'll get used to that broadcast. The difference between that broadcast and what Phil and I brought was Phil and I were Phil and I, you know, we, we grew up here. He was a, he was a bullet. I was a bullet fan. I grew up here. Uh, There's something to be said for having broadcasters who actually, you know, were involved in, in, in the community and grew up in the community is whether it's whatever sport it happens to be that you don't find that very often. Um, You know, when, if you can find two broadcasters who are local guys, man, that, and and who are good and people like them, that's a combination that doesn't happen very often. Uh, And to me, if I'm, if I'm an owner of a team, that's a win-win, man. I got to stick with that because that's what, that's what really touches people. So the fans have really been nice about that. And uh, they, but that's the difference between the two broadcasts. You know, those guys aren't me and Phil. Nothing against those guys. They're good. They do a good broadcast. It's just different when it's two local guys who grew up here. When you had a guy like Phil who played for the team, man, that's 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 huge. And not only played for the team, the guy's jersey's up in the rafters. You know, he was a legendary bullet. Sure. So um, it's different when you have that. Why you would take why you would take that away? That's beyond me. But that's not my call. Sure. Yeah, so, you know, you kind of touched on what you think of, of the new crew. And I was curious, actually, did, did Kutcher ever reach out through any of that? Had you ever spoken to him or anything? Or? Nope, I have not no. talked to him. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the last thing I'll just say, you know, about this, we'll move on to more positive times in a second, too. But I remember being there. I don't know if I even, you know, told you this, but I remember some of the talk, you know, when they replaced Phil and, and then, made the, the change with you too about, you know, wanting somebody with more of a, a social media presence. And that always just struck me as, as 
so bizarre, especially because, you know, I, I know Drew too, and obviously he was a great player and he's a nice guy, but not like he's, you know, the biggest guy on Twitter. Kutcher had been off Twitter for like three years. You know, he doesn't really have any social media profiles. So, uh, I, you know, even the logic just doesn't check out really. Well, you know, I, un I understand. And listen, you know, we had meetings at NBC Sport Washington and they wanted us to tweet. They wanted me to do Facebook, but I, I never did Facebook. But I would tweet a lot. And I didn't just tweet nonsensical stuff. I would try to tweet stuff that either made an impact or if I took, if I saw something behind the scenes, I would take a picture of it and then tweet it out. Like I would always, like we'd be at a hotel and I'd see John come out and he'd stand there and sign autographs for like, you know, 75 people. And I'd take a big picture of that. And I thought, this is really cool. You know, this is some stuff that people don't see all the time uh, or whatever they happen to be. Uh, and I would, you know, if I was on the floor, so I'm on the floor and here's LeBron James standing five feet from me. And I take a picture of his shoe that says something like, you know, equality or whatever he happened to have on his shoe. And then I tweet that out. So these, these were things that to me were kind of impactful that really would be neat for fans to see. So I did a lot of that. Now, look, I'm not the greatest whiz when it comes to technology and, you know, hashtags and all this other stuff. But I learned at least how to take a picture and send out a tweet and say something that was I thought was impactful, that would be interesting to fans. And I did a lot of that. So if that was their reason for wanting to replace me, that seems kind of stupid. I mean, I did enough tweeting to get by. And I thought my talent as a play by play announcer with Phil and our, our chemistry together was pretty good. Uh, I don't think you take somebody off the air because they they don't tweet enough especially to hire somebody that doesn't do it either. But anyway, well, listen, you know, listen, Brian, look around the NBA at guys who have been there for 20, 25, 30, 35 years. I mean, we're talking about guys in their markets who are legendary. Mike Gorman in Boston. Okay. He did the games with Tommy Heinsohn forever. Obviously Tommy just passed. Uh, Eric Reed in Miami has done their play by play since the inception of the Miami heat, 1988. Um, Mike Breen in New York, before that, Marv Albert. Um, George Blaha in Detroit. Mark Zumoff in Philadelphia, my, my counterpart, uh, who works for Philly, you know, Comcast, whatever you're going to call them. Uh, you could go around the league, guys after guys after guys. Um, if somebody had gone to Mike Gorman, who's done, I don't know how long he's done Celtics. Jeez, I don't know, 35 years, 40 minutes, I don't know. It would, it, would be, it would be like going up to Johnny Holiday and saying, you know what, geez, you're 75 years old. Uh, I, I'm, I, I, I kind of think we might want to get somebody maybe a little more, maybe a little younger, whatever. Johnny would look at them and say, get the F out of here. I'm not going anywhere. Mike Gorman would say the same thing. Dude, get out of here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm, you know, I'm the guy. Yeah. Well, I thought Phil and I were the guys, but we weren't. So it shows you that anybody can be replaced. But okay. it was, but to me, that's the correlation that I draw with these other play-by-play -play guys in my business. You know, you you get a guy that's really good at what he does. Nobody's going to come in there and say, "You need to go because we want we want to change." You don't change when you have something that's really really good. Look at the guy that retired in uh, with the LA Clippers. You know. Um, uh, that, that, that did their their TV forever and yeah. and guys all over the country. I mean, they keep their jobs because they're good at what they do. Very rarely does somebody get replaced. It happens in, in the 22 years I was doing the games. I might have seen it happen in one or two markets. And that's yeah. about it. Yeah. And, and I know you've mentioned even other places that it's a fraternity. And a lot of the guys have reached out to you, which I'm sure made you feel uh, respected too to have your peers say how ridiculous it was but yeah anyway more to the uh more positive times you know I, I remember obviously I grew up like I said as a Wizards fan I remember you know taking shots on a little hoop in my basement running around screaming dagger and back <laughs> I love it <laughs> all your iconic calls so you know but I will admit though I, I was born in 91 so I'm a, I'm a young fan relatively speaking how did those develop were, were they kind of organic or did you set out to sort of say you know, I'm going to make these my, my catchphrase, so to speak. Yeah, that's an interesting question because, you know, if you're doing like, uh, let's give you for an example, like Jim Nance, who does obviously the uh, national basketball championship game. And of course he does the masters and all these other great tournaments. 
um, when you go into the final game, okay, say it's the NCAA tournament game, you have two teams, okay, and you know those two teams are playing each other, and you know one of them is going to win. You can think about what you might want to say once that final shot is taken. You know, you can kind of think about that. And I'm sure he has, and all the announcers have. Same thing with the Masters. You know who's in the lead. If Tiger Woods is up by six shots going into the, you know, last round or the last few holes, it gives you a chance to kind of think about what you might want to say when that final putt goes in. It's a little different when you're calling 82 games and each game is its own separate entity and, um, and, and, and you're just calling games. For me, I never went into a game, and I don't think most announcers do, would never went into a game thinking, you know, how can I call this? What should I say? For me, the dagger just sort of came because, you know, here's a guy making a shot at, and I always used it at the end of a game. I never used it with three minutes left or even 30 seconds left because it would, a couple of times it came back to bite me. So I would always wait for it to be the final shot of the game. And I always thought, you know, that's the final, that's the final stab. That's the final dagger going into, you know, to end this game. And that's how that came about. I just came off the top of my head. I just said dagger or, or if a guy made a shot, maybe during the game after a team played 23 seconds of great defense and he hits a shot. And I said, backbreaker, you know, that's what that was. It was a backbreaker. Same thing when, when, when Michael Ruffin threw the ball up into the air and Mo Peterson grabbed it and fired it up in the air and it went in. And I'm thinking to myself that there was like five or six seconds left on the clock when Gilbert Arenas took the free throws. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no way in the world that all of this could have transpired in six seconds. So I screamed, no, not possible. I just, it, it wasn't possible to me that all of these things could happen, including rough and throwing. Oops. I'm thinking to myself, this is not possible. And so that's how that came about. So the dagger was interesting because at first I was using it both for the bullets or wizards and against them. And my general manager at the time called me from Comcast Sportsnet and he said, you know, I don't think you should be using that term because, you know, it's, it, it, it goes against the, the wizards and it has a, that negative connotation. And at the time it was gathering a little bit of steam especially with the sports junkies who were using it on their radio broadcast. And it was starting to become part of the vernacular, you know, around the DMVs, mainly because of the sports junkies. And I've always given them credit for that. They're great guys and good friends. So I said this to the general manager. I said, listen, his name was Sam. He's passed away. He was a great guy. I said, Sam, I understand what you're saying. And I probably shouldn't use it against the Wizards. But I said, this is, this is starting to, to become... Um, a part of my whole reputation. And if you want to call it a brand, it's, I'm, I'm starting to gain some of this recognizability with this word. I said, that's something you can't pay for. You can't buy that. I said, and if that's the case, I don't think I should stop using it. And I'll only use it for the wizards. I won't use it against them. But I think that I should continue to do this because it's something that people are starting to associate with me. And he was smart enough to understand that that was true. And so he said, okay, you can keep doing it. Just don't use it against them. And that's otherwise I was going to be told not to do it anymore, but it stayed. And listen, I was, I think I was judicious with it. I didn't use it all the time. I only used it obviously on a game winning shot. Unfortunately, the Wizards didn't have all that many game winning shots, but they had enough of them with Gilbert and with, with John Wall and Bradley Beal and and I was able to use it with Michael Jordan, obviously. I had some good daggers, yeah. uh, Jordan Crawford. So, we, you know, we had some good ones. And uh, there was none, though, as good as the one when Gilbert hit the shot in Chicago over Kirk Heinrich. That was my favorite. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I was, I was going to ask you about the the no not possible call, too, because that, that's probably my favorite, to be honest, just that, again, transpired organically. And, and for fans that don't know, I – I highly encourage you to go watch the clip where, like you said, the, the Wizards went up three after two free throws. Raptors tried a, a baseball pass down three, three seconds left. I think Michael Ruffin like catches the ball, 
tries to fling it up in the air as high as he can, thinking the time's going to run out. Morris Peterson catches it, flings it up, goes in, sends it to overtime, and the yeah. Raptors end up winning, right? That game. Yeah. yeah, it was unbelievable. And I, like I said, it just the fact that all of this transpired in five or six seconds was not possible to me. And the, that's how those words came out of my mouth. Right. Uh, you mentioned Michael Jordan. Uh, obviously, I have to ask you briefly about Mike. What was it like, you know, being in that traveling party around him? And, and what do you remember most uh, about those years? It was an amazing thing, Brian, because think about it. How often do any of us get to actually interact with a living legend, with an icon? First of all, most people don't anyway. The fact that we're in this business, you know, it gives us the privilege sometimes of doing that, but not on a regular basis. We'll stick a mic in front of Muhammad Ali, who I've interviewed before, or Howard Cosell. We'll stick a mic in front of, you know, um, some of the greats of all time. Um, LeBron James, you, you know, any of these guys, uh, you know, Sonny Jurgensen, doesn't matter who you're talking about, but we don't get to, you know, actually become, I use the word friendly with them or, or, or interact with them on an almost daily basis, but we were able to do that. Phil Chenier and I were able to do that and Dave Johnson and Glenn Consor because Michael Jordan was part of our team, first as the president of basketball operations, then when he decided to come out of retirement and play for the, for the Wizards. So we, you know, we got to hang out with him and I've been in bars with him. I've been in clubs with him. I've had dinners with him. I've played in golf with him and, you know, and gotten to, to see a little bit what he was like, you know, and I will tell you that he was a ball buster, man. He used to break balls. He loved to, to, to you know, joke around mm -hmm. and, and, and we could joke around with him because a, there was no pressure and B, we knew he wasn't going to be there forever. Unfortunately, the circumstances by which he left the team were not good, but still while he was there, it was a blast. And listen, man, I got to tell you, when you have, when you can see what, uh, how an icon, how a living legend like him lives, it's mind boggling, man. We'd come back to the team plane sometime to come back to Washington. He'd have his private jet right next to it to take him back to Chicago because we had a day off. And so he could, uh, you know, he could go home for a day and then he and then he'd come back to DC. Uh, I would see him interact with people all the time. And it was phenomenal to see the people freak out when they saw him. We were in New York at Madison Square Garden. I went into the locker room after the game and waiting for him in the locker room was Derek Jeter and Ahmad Rashad, two of buddies of his. And the three of them were going to go out in New York that night and, you know, go party or whatever they do. Mm -hmm. And we were going to go back to DC. So I went in the locker room and I said hello to Ahmad Rashad, who, you know, watched our games and all of that. And, and then when Michael got ready to leave, there was a boy in a wheelchair in the locker room with his dad. And the kid was horribly disfigured. It was, you know, tragic to see. And Jordan went up to him. And he got grabbed his ball and he signed it and he bent down and he took a picture with the kid. And I, I don't know if the kid's still with us or not. This was many, obviously many years ago, 2002. Um, don't you know that that kid looked at that picture every day of his life and thought about that? And I said to Michael Jordan, I said, listen, I know you are who you are. And I know you've come back to play games with us and that's all well and good. I said, but, but that's why you're here right now. That's, that's what, that's what makes an impact by what you do on this earth. You make that impact to those kinds of people who will never, ever forget that in their entire life. And I said, and that's, that's nice to see. And I said, I hope you keep doing that. So we walk out of the locker room and now I'm trailing these three guys. I forgot that they were going out to play because they ended up going out an exit and Jordan turned around and looked at me and said, where are you going? I said, well, aren't you guys going to the bus? They said, no, we're going out. And I went, oh shit. And then I had to hustle to get to the bus before they left me because I didn't realize those guys weren't going back to D.C. But as we're walking through the bowels of Madison Square Garden, the workers, the people that were around are seeing Michael Jordan. And keep in mind, you got Derek Jeter right there with him and Ahmad Rashad. And people are freaking out. It was like you saw the Beatles or maybe somebody else in your generation that's bigger than that. Um, the people freaked out when they saw Michael Jordan. When we go to a hotel, hundreds of people would be lined up. It could be three o'clock in the morning. 
to see this guy, get a glimpse of him. And so to see how an icon lives like that was an amazing thing. And um, I'll, I'll always, those memories are indelible, man. I'll never, ever forget him. It was really cool. And I just saw him this summer. I was in, <laughs> I was in um, Martha's Vineyard with my wife and some people. And um, we went to a golf course that this guy belonged to to have lunch. And we're sitting there and he said, now look, it's gonna be a little crazy because President Obama, former President Obama is here playing golf with Michael Jordan and a couple of other guys. And I thought, oh, wow, that's cool. So we sat down on the veranda to have lunch. And about 40 minutes later, here comes this, it was a sixum. And here comes this group of guys and here comes Michael. And I said, well, shit, I, I'm going to go say hi to him. So I got up, excused myself from the table. And I walked, you know, 20 yards to where he was. And he was coming the other way. And he saw me and I said, MJ. And he said, Stevie boy, which is what he used to call me. And we came over and we talked for a couple of minutes. And he asked me how everything was. And I asked him how everything was. And we just talked. And it was really cool. And I went back to the table. And the people at the table were like, oh, my God, you do know Michael Jordan. Like, yeah, I spent three years with the guy. So um, it was it was fun. And, uh, you know, I still like I say, I still see him every once in a while. And he still belongs to some golf courses around here and um, loves that game, obviously. So it, it was cool seeing how he lived. Yeah, no, I, he obviously wasn't wasn't Bulls MJ. And, you know, those teams were, were bad Wizards teams. He didn't go to the playoffs. But I think people forget sometimes that, that was Michael Jordan playing it basically 40 years old, still scoring over 20 points a game. Yep. Played in all 82 games his second year. He scored more than 43 times as a 40-year-old. Unbelievable. If those years happened today in, like, this social media era, how, how differently are they remembered? Well, it would have been – a lot more people would have remembered it. I mean, I think, you know, and I think that's why – I'll give you an example why Joe Jacoby's not in the Hall of Fame. He clearly should be. And as much as I love Russ Grimm, who deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, Joe Jacoby should be in the Hall of Fame before Russ Grimm. But people don't remember, okay? Those people that vote, they don't know, and they don't remember. Um, now, Jordan's a little different. He's Everybody knows who he is, and he's iconic. But he was better at 40 than 75% of the other guys in the NBA that, you know, guards or whatever you want to call them. Uh, he was still that good. There were times when he wasn't, but there were still times when he was. And not only that, he was Michael Jordan. So he probably made Abe Poland, the late Abe Poland, 70 or $80 million because of the fact that he was Michael Jordan. And so when we would go on the road, every arena was sold out. Now, let me tell you something, Brian. Before Michael Jordan, nobody sold out to see the Wizards play, okay, on the road. Every arena was sold out yeah. in the 29 other cities in the country or 28, whatever they are you know, because LA has two teams and New York has two teams, but all those arenas were sold out and Washington was sold out. And, you know, obviously Michael Jordan made this organization a lot of money. So um, he was great when he played back then, even though he was 40 and even though we knew he was only going to play a couple of years, he was still a pretty good player. Absolutely. Um, I know, you know, during this pandemic, it's hard for anybody to think much ahead of what you're doing the next day, but I know you mentioned, you know, you're doing some local games, you're doing some Terps games, Georgetown games. Have you thought at all about, you know, if you'd like to be doing it for a team full time again, or if you'd like to just do the part time? Have you paid any attention yet to kind of what your next step uh, will be forward? Well, what's interesting is that one of the conversations I had with Michael Jordan that day at Martha's Vineyard was the fact that at the time they had dismissed their radio play by play guy. And I told him, look, I'd be interested in doing that job. And he said, well, that's good to know. And the next day I was text, uh, emailing back and forth with Fred Whitfield, who's their president, who used to be here with, with Michael. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually had a series of interviews with them uh, for that job. So um, I had some interest in that. I didn't get the job, which is probably good. I mean, I'm, I'm not necessarily wanna be traipsing around the country you know, doing radio play by play, although it was interesting to me at the time. At the time, I was really still interested in looking for that kind of an NBA job. Now, as it turns out, nobody's traveling. All the guys are doing games from studios and whatever. Yeah. But, you know, I would have been away from my home. In fact, the last thing MJ asked me was, would you move to Charlotte? And um, 
I said, well, I do whatever I have to do. I don't want to move to Charlotte, but, you know, and I love the city. My best friend lives there and I love the city. It's a great city. Uh, but I, you know, I, this is my, this is where I live. I'm born and raised here and I've been back here for 37 years. I'm not going anywhere. So yes, to answer your question, I would have entertained the possibility of doing play-by-play for another team in another city. But the fact that I'm not is probably a good thing. And truth be told, I really am enjoying my time right now. Uh, I've been in this business for 47 years. I got into it in 1974 in college. Uh, That's when I got into radio. I got into TV in 77. So I've been doing TV in five different markets for a long time. And I kind of enjoy not having to do that grind anymore, especially the way the TV business is now. It's horrible. Everybody's taking pay cuts. They're getting fired. Uh, It's a shitty business. Um, And, you know, my friend Bob Rathman, who does the play-by-play for the for the Atlanta Hawks, who's a great play-by-play guy and a good friend, he said to me after this stuff happened with me, he said, uh, he said, uh, doing uh, games and people in sports casting, it's the greatest job in the world in the shittiest business in the world. And it is, it's a bad, it's a cold, you know, doggy dog business, man. It's cutthroat. There's always somebody behind you looking to cut your throat and take your job. So um, I'm glad I don't have to deal with management or any of that stuff, you know? Uh, It's a nice feeling to be able to do a few games here and there is is fun for me. Uh, And and, uh, yeah, listen, I'm disappointed. I'm not doing NBA play-by-play anymore, but a few college games here and there is great. And uh, I don't don't miss it as much as I thought I would, at least not now, I did initially. But now I'm able to actually watch the games with the sound up and, um, and, uh, and enjoy seeing the Wiz play and watching other teams and other games and sitting around uh, eating a sandwich and being able to go take a leak when I need to. There you go. Look, I, I know I've taken even a little more of your time than I said I would. Really, really appreciate your time. Really enjoyed this chat. I know On the Road with Buck and Phil is the name of your podcast. You're on Twitter at, at Steve Buckhands. A- anything else to promote? Any, anywhere else you want fans to find you? Anything else coming up? Or- no, listen, I, like I say, I'm, ha- I'm very thankful for the nice comments that fans make. Uh, I try to answer I try to answer them either on Twitter or I'll usually follow somebody and send them a direct message uh, because I just, you know, like them to know that I'm, I'm hearing what they have to say. So thank the fans for doing all of that. I appreciate you and what you do. Uh, People that are watching you or listening to your podcast or watching your Twitter, you know, it's nice to get comments from someone like you who actually has experience in with the team and in the business and, and in, you know, in the business of basketball. So uh, that's nice to know too, because there's so many folks out there that just make comments. They don't really know, have the experience to do that, but uh, you do. So it's nice to see that. And I appreciate you having me on. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more of your comments. Appreciate it. Thank you, Buck and uh, Wizards fans again. Go check out his podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode of Scout the Wiz. And uh, on behalf of all Wizards fans, like I said, Buck, uh, I know you can't say it and it's harder to say, but Uh, the broadcast has gone severely downhill and all Wizards fans miss you and and thank you for your 22 incredible years. So much appreciated. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate the comment.